Well, yes, welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. Thank you for joining us for this time together as we look into God's Word. And uh, it's, it's a joy to be able to look into God's Word and to know that as we're doing it, the Holy, God's Holy Spirit is, is, is teaching us, it's instructing us, it's encouraging us as we look into the Word of God. Let's pray together. Father, we look to you and we give you thanks for this opportunity to look again into your Word. We pray that you would open our hearts and minds to receive what you would have us receive from the text that's before us this evening. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Looking now to the text that we'll be using, we've been studying from uh, first Peter, the first leader, Peter's first letter, and we have come now to chapter 4. We have been in chapter 4 for a little while. Uh, we are now at verses 6 to 11 verses 6 to 11, and we're looking at the end-time priorities that Peter is talking about. End-time priorities is our focus for this, this, this study this evening. Uh, let me read, uh, and if you have your Bible, I would encourage you to take your Bible out so you can follow along and know where we are when we're making reference to certain uh, portions of Scripture here. Um, verses 6 of of. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 6 to 11. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, Keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Uh, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belongs glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Praise the Lord. When we look at this portion of Scripture here, um, there, are, there are several things about these six verses that are obvious. I think the first uh, um, obvious thing is uh, we have a verse that is difficult to understand because of its unusual content. This is verse 6. Uh, the second thing that is obvious is that we're reminded of the seriousness of the times in which we live. That's verse 7. It makes that emphasis. And the third obvious point about these verses is that Peter wants us to place a priority on loving each other. That's in verse 8. Therefore, to be true to the priorities of these six verses, we need to place our focus where Peter places his. Attempted though we might be to spend time on verse 6 simply because we desperately wish to understand what Peter is stating about or talking about when he's talk, he says that the gospel being preached to those who are dead. I believe there would be much less value in, in digging into this than in looking at the obvious priority of this section of scripture, which is verse 8. The words, above all, after all a kind of an obvious uh, clue to what is most important in these verses. However, let us uh, look briefly at verse 6. It reads, For this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, that though, de though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the Spirit the way God does. This verse connects backwards, so to speak, with verse 19 of chapter 3. There, in verse 19 of chapter 3, we read, in which he, referring to Jesus, went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Now, connecting the thoughts of these two verses and those leading into them, our understanding is this, that Jesus, prior to his bodily resurrection, went in spirit form and proclaimed the gospel to those persons 
who had died during the flood, maybe even those died who died prior to the flood, persons who had rejected the, the way and the word of God, as proclaimed by Noah, the preacher. So Peter's explanation as to why Christ did this was so that, to quote Peter, though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Now these imprisoned spirits had been judged in the flesh at the time of their death, for death is the common judgment due all humanity. We recall that God declared to Adam and Eve that the, their first act of disobedience would lead to death. Now, Peter evidently is not speaking of a final judgment, for that is yet to come for all humanity and fallen angels. The judgment of God against the unbelievers that were Noah's contemporaries was in contrast to the judgment or the grace given to Noah and his family. You understand that when the Bible uses the word judgment, it both has the negative side and the positive side. And the negative side, these persons died because of their lack of faith and trust in God. On the positive side, Noah received God's favor. The, those who disbelieved and remained in their unrepentant state, their judgment was death. Noah and his family, on the other hand, were saved, thereby escaping that judgment uh, of God. As we've stated last week, however, we're still left to wonder as to the purpose of Christ preaching the gospel to dead people. Peter seems to suggest that even though they had received the common judgment due all persons, for all have sinned, in that they died, yet they might live in the spirit the way God does. What does he mean by that statement? Expositors and commentators have written tomes on this, and the one thing they appear to have in common is disagreement. But perhaps, perhaps, just perhaps, and this is a long shot, what Peter means by his statement that they might live in the spirit is that they will be denied the physical resurrection that will be the inheritance of persons of faith. Because the resurrection is part of, part of the inheritance of, of those who are persons of faith. But will be saved, but they will be saved from the damnation in hell. After all, the prison that they were, that uh, Peter's referring to, is not the hell of punishment, but simply the place of the dead. Now, at this point, I'll just simply say enough said on that. I leave you to do your own study. I leave you to do your own speculation. But I want to suggest that you would be better occupied looking at scriptures that do not take you so deep into speculation that you drown in, in the world of, of your imagination. So let's leave that verse, verse 6. And let's go on to verse 7. Because verse 7 is a timely reminder. It was so to Peter's first readers of his, this letter. And it is the same for us today as well. It reads, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Now that we understand the word end here to have a dual reference. First, it, it, it is the end in the sense of a conclusion and a termination of all things. But secondly, it means the end in the sense of the culmination of all things, the point in history to which all things are ultimately headed. Of this, of course, is, has to do with the return of Christ and the end of this physical universe and God's making a new heavens and a new earth. Uh, it also refers to the end of time in which sin and lawlessness which currently prevails because of the prince of this world, well, and he's allowed to have his way to a large extent over this fallen world, but this will come to an end at the return of Christ. God's new creation will have not even a hint of sin. So Peter's reminded, reminded to us that the end of all things is near, is intended to be a word of encouragement to us who are believers, more than a word of warning. Some of us uh, last day's preachers like to focus on the negative side of things. 
Yes, there is an implicit warning here. But it is a word of encouragement to the readers of this text that God will bring his plans and his purpose through Christ to a final culmination. The king shall come. He shall judge the world. And he shall set all things that are out of sync with his way, his word, and his will. He will set them right for all eternity. It is in the light of this encouraging reminder that we are admonished to be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of our prayers. Now, it's interesting that Peter hasn't said to be self-controlled and and sober-minded because Jesus is coming soon or that the end is near. He's already reminded us uh, that the culmination of all things is near. But he says we need to be self-controlled and, and sober-minded for the sake of our prayers. So how do we understand that? Is, is it similar to his encouragement to husbands to love their wives in an understanding way so that their prayers may not be hindered, as he stated in chapter 3, verse 7? Well, certainly that will be part of it, that our prayers not be hindered. For clearly, the the lack of self-control and the lack of being sober-minded will definitely hinder not only the answers to prayer that we desire, but also the very occasion of prayer itself. But, but, But as we recognize that prayer is not all about petition or intercession, It's not all about asking God for things, either for ourselves or for others. We see clearly that that a a disciplined spiritual life has has at its core communion with God. And how can we enjoy that sweet communion when we allow our flesh to so dominate our minds and actions that we abandon Holy Spirit empowered self-control and give way to the desires of the flesh and to the carnal mind. You see, part and parcel of self-control and sober-mindedness is living a life of faith and dependence on God. Fear and panic may prompt us to pray out of desperation from time to time, but this is not the way of the child of God. So even though we understand that the end of all things are at hand, We're not in fear and panic. We're not building bunkers and stocking them with months of provisions in case some conspiracy theory comes to fruition. Instead, we steadily trust the Lord. We know that He is Lord of all and that even as things are speeding towards the the great day of the culmination of all things when Christ shall return, we, God's people, like Daniel of old, we take our place of prayer as a witness to our faith in the one who is really in charge. Obviously, prayer is about us and God. He is the one we worship and honor in our prayers. He is the one, it is to him that we give our thanks. It is to him that we make our requests. It is to him that we submit our wills. Prayer is not about sending our thoughts towards others. I've heard this so often recently, this idea often heard in politically, this politically correct world in which we live about sending our thoughts and prayers to those persons who are in grief or in loss or going through some tragedy. Listen, this is all New Age nonsense. The effectiveness of prayer is not based on how many people join their energy together in some sort of quasi-prayer. No. This is a that, this idea is, is a human-centered, New Age concept. Prayer is, is about us, frail, fragile, faulty human beings connecting with the creator of the universe. It is an expression of total dependency on God and a denial of our self-sufficiency that would make us think that somehow or another sending our thoughts towards somebody or praying towards somebody in somebody's situation would make a difference. Prayer is about speaking to God, communing with God, and asking, if necessary, God to do something because we're unable to do it ourselves. Yes, my brothers and sisters, the end of all things is at hand. As God's people, we look forward to the day of Christ's return 
when even the last enemy shall be judged and placed under Christ's feet. Therefore, we commit ourselves to keep our minds and our hearts heavenward, fixed on Jesus, praying, therefore, for us. Is that not just a matter of occasions, but praying is a way of life? Peter does not leave his readers to regard their primary duty on this earth to be prayerful preparation for, for the end times. No, he reminds them that, ju that just as there is this vertical priority, this connection with God, there is also a horizontal priority, their relationship with other people. So in verse 8, Peter writes, above all, and notice that emphasis, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Now, Peter has written elsewhere the encouragement concerning brotherly love, that word that is phileo, Philadelphia, um, brotherly love. It's First Peter chapter 1, verse 22, and also chapter 3, verse Eight, he talks about that. But here, it is not phileo that he is speaking about, but agape, not the love that is conditioned on some pre-existing relationship, be that friend or relative, but a love that is unconditional. Agape is the kind of love that God has for all of us. It is the, the purest form of love, not, not conditioned on or dependent on some bond that exists among persons and, and thus stimulates affection and care. Rather, it's the kind of love that causes God to love those who hate him with the same affection that he has towards those who love him. Agape is non-contingent love. And for that, we give God thanks. Because of that, because of that, the scripture tells us, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were his enemies, he suffered and died to rescue us from our sins. This is the kind of love that covers a multitude of sins. Clearly, Peter is speaking of sins that are, as, as actions that, that are committed so as to result in, in fractured relationships within the body of Christ, within the church. Perhaps, for example, it is when a young woman becomes pregnant out of wedlock. How should we in the church as God's people respond? Some people promote the idea that, that if we accept the person, we condone their sin. So rather than, than reaching out in love and support and forgiveness, the, the young woman's rejected. But agape love covers a multitude of sins. What does Peter mean when he uses the word covers? Certainly, it is the opposite of exposes. Love does not expose the fault or failure of others. I hope you understand that. What has happened, may I ask, to my sins and to yours once God has forgiven them? Are they not covered? Has he not cast them from himself as far as the east is from the west? Has he not cast them to the very bottom of the deepest ravine, in a sense, of the ocean? And so if that is how God deals with our sins, with my sins, with your sins, how then should I deal with the sins of others in the body of Christ? I gave the example of a young girl found pregnant out of wedlock, but, but there are numerous other types of sins that needs, <laughs> that love needs to cover, to cover in the body. That is why Peter uses the word multitude, for sins come in a variety of forms and in ways in which inflicts consequences upon us here and now, as well as in eternity. But the response of God's people in the church should be modeled after God's actions towards us. His love has covered a multitude of our sins. Now, I can, in my imagination, hear somebody respond with, but, but that's based on our repentance. No, it is not based on our repentance. We receive the benefits of his love. We receive forgiveness and reconciliation when we repent, yes. 
but it was while we were yet sinners that Christ died for us. In other words, God's love was not in response to our, anything we did. It was not in response to our repentance. Instead, it was his proactive display of love towards all of us, even those who will never repent. For God so loved the world. What? A saved world? A repentant world? No. A sin stained, riven through with sin. That is God's love. And so, if he loved us only when we repented, it would not be agape love at all. For then it would be conditional. Conditioned on our responses and our behaviors. So, likewise for us, Peter is reminding us that our predisposition towards each other must be one of agape love. Because if love is already engaged, then when someone sins, it is simply a matter of taking, in a sense, one's foot off the clutch and moving forward in loving action to cover, to cover over a multitude of sins. It's worth noting how Peter emphasizes this word of encouragement to us in this verse. The word keep speaks of the constancy or the continuation of this demonstration of love. But that idea of keeping and the constancy and continuation is buttressed by the word fervently, since in the Greek this word carries both the idea of intensity as well as continuity. So Peter is saying to keep keeping on deeply and intensely loving each other. For such love as this will always cover over. We'll always bury, uh, uh, or, or bury, yes, bury out of sight from reprisal and from accusation any number of multiplied sins. With such an emphasis on agape love that we find in verse 8 there, the additional encouragement found in verses 9 and 10 are simply natural or logical companions. For such love will be genuinely and graciously hospitable to others. Yes, we will offer hospitality to others without complaining, without being, without grudging it, without complaining at all. And such love will motivate us to selflessly use our gifts, whether those gifts are spiritual gifts, natural gifts, or material gifts. We'll use them in service to others. Love is always the right hand of stewardship. The closing verse in this section expands on our stewardship, but it places an important reminder that goes beyond stewardship of our gifts to all of life. He reminds us that everything we do should be, what does he say? In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Now that is surely our ultimate purpose. Our ultimate motivation. To glorify God through our Lord Jesus Christ. As Peter writes, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Well, we add our amen to Peter's amen. Father, we look to you and we thank you for this time of uh, prayer, this time of looking into your word, studying and allowing your Holy Spirit to speak to us. We ask, therefore, that what we have done will be used by your blessed Holy Spirit to, to minister to us in the church at this time. The emphasis of your word, above all, to keep on fervently, intensely, loving each other, for love covers a multitude of sins, is a word we need at this hour throughout the whole church, throughout the whole world. So help us, Lord, to not only hear the word, but be doers of the word. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, until next uh, week, Wednesday, um, may the God bless you and, and guide you and and direct your steps to do those things 
where you can use the gifts that he's given you and be good, faithful stewards of those gifts so that in all things in your life, Christ may be glorified through Jesus Christ. I've seen God's family as they stand in the presence of the King. As they lift their hearts and voices and their hands towards heaven raise. Yes, I've got a glimpse of heaven because I've seen God's Oh, no. 